Hello, I'm Professor David Ruzik, Illinois Energy Prof. And today, I'm going to tell you about dispelling the myths about nuclear power. This is a talk that I typically give to high school students and freshmen and non-majors. In fact, today we actually have a live by Zoom studio audience. Each of the topics I'm going to talk about are presented in greater detail in one of my other Illinois Energy Prof videos, but this is an overview. And I want to start this first by asking just a couple simple questions, all right? So think in your mind, don't go look it up, you know, th th there's no uh, grade being given. What percentage of U.S. energy use is from solar and wind combined? Everyone think of a percentage in your mind. You see the windmills everywhere, you hear about the solar panels, okay? That number is 3.6%. A lot more than it used to be, as you'll see, okay? And now I want to ask another question. What percentage of U.S. energy is from fossil fuels? So again, think of a number, think of it in your mind, right? And this answer is 80%. Now, you think about those numbers and um, you realize that uh, there's a long way to go if we have a significant worry about greenhouse gases and global warming. Let's look at U.S. energy by source. And here are the 2019 numbers. This is uh, pre-pandemic, so it gives us stuff. And if I looked at those top three, that's the fossil fuels, that's the 80%. You know, this is in quads, quadrillion BTUs, but it's around 100, right? And then we can see hydro, and we can see solar and wind, and we can compare this to 13 years ago. And you can see several important things has happened. We have built many more natural gas power plants and taken coal plants off of line. Coal makes more CO2 per unit energy than natural gas. That's great. Wind has gone up by a factor of 10. That's impressive. Ethanol, biodiesel up by a factor of 4 and solar energy by a factor of 15. And you say, wow, that was great, 13 years from now, let's do those same percentages, we're really cooking. Yeah, let's compare five years ago to today. You can see the wind progression has slowed down dramatically, and the solar has as well. So, if we're thinking about energy, there's one thing here that's been pretty constant nuclear power, and it makes 20% of our electricity, and it makes no CO2. So why don't we just use more of this? We don't depend on the wind blowing or it being daytime, or you, we already use on ethanol something like 40% of our corn. So what are the objections to nuclear power? Okay, and I bet you know them. I bet you know, I bet if you just think in your mind, you'd say, ah, radiation, AKA Simpsons, we're all gonna end up with three eyes, all right? Accidents, oh my God, they could melt down and blow up like atom bombs and, and that, that would be unmitigated disaster. And wastes, the wastes are there forever. There's no place to safely put them. We are hurting future generations like yours. These are the myths, and in the rest of this talk, I'm going to try to explain that. There are objections to nuclear power, predominantly on the economic side, but they're really not these. So let's start off yeah, and give you a quiz. All right, compared to background levels, how much radiation is given off by a nuclear power plant during normal operation? All right, you got some answers there. Think of one in your mind. Answer is A. All of the waste, all of the radioactive material is contained and extremely well shielded. A coal power plant gives off some radiation, not much, not much to worry about at all, all right? Just because there's some um, uranium, thorium, other radioactive materials in small amounts in the coal. So 
let me talk a little bit more about radiation. And I brought here a Geiger counter. All right. Handheld Geiger counter. I'm going to turn it on. And you can hear some clicks. I've got this by my microphone. You hear that? And, and you can see if you could, and I'd zoom in maybe, but you could see that the meter is moving. I'm not particularly radioactive, more than the next person, but this is background. We always live in the world in a bath of ionizing radiation. And so what you really need to do if you're worried about radiation is compare it to background levels. 15,000 gamma rays go through you every second. It has nothing to do with nuclear power or other things. I realize you still hear those clicks and maybe it's disconcerting. I'll turn it off. But we are bathed by radiation. And there's a number for it. Millirem, 300 millirem per year, naturally. And you know, if you live in Denver, Colorado, I pick out Denver, not because of something bad about Denver, it happens to be the mile high city, right? The elevation of Denver is 5,280 feet, all right? And because of that, there's less atmosphere there compared to us down here in Champaign at 740 feet, all right? So we have a lot more shielding. It knocks out, right? It knocks out that radiation, this extra atmosphere. Or if you fly in a plane up here at 30,000 feet or more, you get even more radiation. Does it kill you? No, you can measure it though, all right? Power plants have no radioactive emissions. And even an accident like Three Mile Island the worst accident in the United States gave people only one and a half millirem extra. That's the amount when you get one transcontinental flight. So, what about accidents? All right, so that's going to be another topic. And of course, there have been very well publicized accidents in the world. And uh, probably the absolute worst one ever was a Chernobyl power plant. But it can't happen here. And there are two very good reasons. And the first one of those is containment. All right? Containment building. You see, a containment building is around all of the reactors not just in the United States, but in Japan, in actually everywhere except for the former Soviet Union, all right? And these containment buildings are massive. They're expensive, they're big, and they're in place before anything goes wrong. And even before 9-11, the safety criteria was if a jet airplane crashes into them, they don't break. Now, they never imagined someone would intentionally crash an airliner into this. They thought maybe an engine would fall off and the engine would go hurtling in, okay? They're made in a dome-like structure, right? Three feet thick of reinforced concrete. Inside of that, a five-eighths inch steel layer. These things are not going to break. Chernobyl did not have a containment building around it. And therefore, when things went wrong inside, they got out. Things go wrong in reactors in the rest of the world, they don't get out. Now, just to prove how this works, <laughs> I'm going to show you a short movie. Uh, it's got some German subtitles, even better for my European audience, of a plane crashing into a containment building. Okay, this is an F-4 Phantom Jet, all right? And it's on a track because otherwise it would take off. And they are actually going to propel this to 500 miles per hour. And it will hit a section of a containment building wall. I love blowing things up and this would be so 
fun. Now that's the block right there, and you'll see the tip of the wing goes past. That's not slicing the block. The block is actually perfectly fine from this. The wing tip goes through, not through the block, just over the edge of the block, okay? But the rest of the block is fine. Sure, some scorch marks. The plane is atomized. But you can really build a structure that can stand up to that type of punishment. Now that was number one. We have containment buildings. Chernobyl did not. There's a second reason, okay? Our reactors are moderated and cooled by the same water. The water leaks out, boils away, the nuclear reaction stops. The Chernobyl reactor was cooled by water. After all, you turn water into steam, make electricity, but it was moderated by blocks of carbon. Now, let me explain this in a little more detail, right? You're going to get a little bit of a nuclear physics lesson here. All right? We're going to have a neutron. That's what this is right here. This is a neutron, a blue dot, and it's going to crash into some type of fissile material, say U-235. All right? So it does this, and it gets absorbed. So right now, this becomes U-236, which is unstable, all right? So it's kind of shaking around. And it may fission, split. We get uh, fission products, okay? And they're a variety of things. They end up being the high-level nuclear wastes. And you also get three neutrons, right? Not every time you get three Right? It's uh, on average something like, I don't know, somewhere between two and three, right? Those are more neutrons. And these neutrons are going really fast, all right? The neutrons are really moving. If I put this in perspective, here is a graph of the chance of fissioning happening. And it's a log graph. If I look on this vertical axis, each of those marks is a factor of 10. And here is the energy of the neutron. Those neutrons that came out of the fission reaction, they were here at a million EV. Okay, they're created at this energy. And you look across at the chance of fissioning, it, it's pretty low, right? It says one there, 10 to the zero. But if I slow them down to here, to thermal energies, that chance of fissioning is a thousand times higher. So to get a nuclear reactor to work, you have to moderate. That's why you use a moderator. It means you have to slow down the neutrons. Otherwise, you just can't sustain a fission reaction. So you've got to slow them down. So what do we do it with? Well, fast neutrons are produced, but it's slow ones that cause the fissions, right? And you have a couple choices of what you could use to slow down neutrons, all right? You can slow down neutrons with blocks of graphite, okay? Neutron could come and hit here, or you could slow them down with water, all right? There has to be a moderator. There has to be something that slows down the neutrons. Now, we also need water to cool the reactor, right? This is the water that turns into steam, that turns the turbine, that runs the generator, that makes the electricity, all right? And you need that so it won't overheat. But if you use the same water for both, all right, then a meltdown is physically impossible, all right? Here's the water. And if my neutron was coming through, say this little bottle cap's my neutron, Right? And I'm pouring it and I'm hitting the water. That fast neutron's hitting the water, right? That is stopping it, it's slowing it. Now, this neutron could also hit the graphite, right? That will slow it down too. But this is our coolant. And if you think about this, let's say someone uh, lets all the water leak out. Maybe there's an earthquake. Maybe there was uh, a mistake, a break in the color line, or someone turned it off. 
This neutron has nothing to slow down with anymore. It will keep going. It will stay a fast neutron, and that means the chain reaction will stop. At Chernobyl, you still always had the graphite, even though the cooling water was empty. And that meant the neutrons could slow down and the chain reaction would continue. So, can a nuclear power plant explode like a nuclear bomb under the right circumstances? Think about this. Talked about the reaction turning off, but is there something you could do to make it explode like an atom bomb? Hmm? One in a billion, one in a million, one in a hundred thousand, one in ten thousand, or no, it's physically impossible. And that's the answer. We've talked about moderation of why Chernobyl can't happen here. But this is yet another safety feature people don't recognize, which is even true in Chernobyl. Okay? You see, to make a bomb, you need the fissile isotope right, the one that can fission, to be 90%. And to make a reactor, you only need it to be 3%. And indeed, at both Chernobyl and the reactors in the West, that percentage is about 3%. You have to enrich it, right? In the ground, uranium starts out 0.7% U-235, so you need a big enrichment plant. That's why there's always controversies over companies or machines or, or countries making enrichment because they could enrich it all the way up to bomb level. Finding uranium isn't that hard. So if we have to have 90% but a reactor is only 3% uranium-235, I don't care how hot it gets, I don't care if it, the reaction keeps going, it will keep going and make heat as Chernobyl did, but it will not blow up like an atom bomb, all right? So if we have graphite, right, and it's going to get very hot, and we have water, which could decompose into hydrogen, well, you have something much more like a chemical explosion, you know, like one of these. And since you don't have a containment building, what we get is a actual bang. Like that. An explosion of Chernobyl was an ordinary one like dynamite would cause. And indeed, if we look at the pictures of it right afterwards, you can see that no containment building and you've got a big hole where the reactor was. And that means the fission products went up in the air and around Europe. And those are the high level wastes. There's another picture right after the accident. By the way, this other side, there's another nuclear reactor here. It kept going. This is not a nuclear explosion. This thing would be like glass if that was an atom bomb. Now what they did in the former Soviet Union is that they built a containment building afterwards. All right? Much better to have it first. If we had it first, we wouldn't be talking about Chernobyl now. Now, you might say, okay, well, there's other reactor accidents. Fukushima was in the West. What about that one? Well, remember, the disaster came from a giant tsunami, an earthquake, a magnitude 9 earthquake with a 40-foot wall of water. And those were beyond the design considerations. They didn't think they'd have that big. They had a seawall up to protect the generators. I don't know, 30 some feet, not enough for that wave, right? And actually, even though that happened, the reactor defense systems worked as planned. The problem is that, look, that's a ship on the ground, right? This uh, tidal wave and disaster and earthquake killed 18,000 people. The nuclear plant killed no one. Now, what about uh, uh, the explosions you heard about at Fukushima? Well, there are panels on the top of it called blast panels, 
right? In case it collected hydrogen up here, and it did, they're supposed to blast away, and they did. The containment building is this thick area here, this three foot thick concrete around it reinforced that had a containment building. The containment building survived the earthquake, right? There's a picture of a person down there to give you a, a sense of scale. Um, the thing though is that the spent fuel, the fuel that they've already taken out of the reactor, right, to, to ultimately go and dispose of, is in a swimming pool. You use swimming pools to protect against the radiation exposure, right? Because you would lift out in a crane and you take, that's the crane, you take it apart and you put it down here. And that's a spent fuel. There's a couple problems with this. One is it's way above ground level, okay? And that needs to contain water. And it's outside of the containment building. So, what happens is because the uh, first line of defense was uh, backup generators, okay, all right, backup uh, generators to make electricity to keep the pumps going, right, and you want the pumps going because they have to keep that spent fuel underwater, and the waves crashed over, right, and uh, wiped them out. But there's a second backup. There are batteries. Right, because we need to run electricity to run pumps. And those batteries, you know, six hours. Wow, that should be a long time. In six hours, we should be able to get a, a truck over there. We should be able to get either backup batteries or we should be able to get a generator online. But not if you have an unmitigated disaster of a tidal wave, an earthquake, wiping out the local population and all of the roads. So eventually, the batteries died away. And then the spent fuel gets uncovered, it warms up, it's not a nuclear explosion, it evolves hydrogen, right? And the spent fuel does have radioactive material in it when it gets too hot, and radiation is released. And now we come back to this question about magnitudes of release. People were evacuated, except for the workers at the plant who were all monitored, the dose to the public was low by the comparisons of what you get under normal background. And yes, it messed up miles from the plant, which are being cleaned up. Differences between Fukushima and other reactors in the United States or other places in the world. First, it was a pretty old plant, about 40 years old at the time of the accident. And one of the things that caused those blast panels to go off and the radioactive material to be dispersed were hydrogen explosions. Ever since Three Mile Island in the United States, our plants have hydrogen absorbers to guard against that particular accident scenario. But I think the most important thing is that new plants since the year 2000 are called Generation 3 and they're passively safe, which means I needed both of these things to pump water, right? I needed these to pump water onto the waste fuel or to pump water um, into other varieties of cooling, cooling the current fuel. In a generation three reactor, I don't need to pump water. I have walk away safety, natural convection, hot air rising, cool air falling, which you can't stop, is enough to be able to keep those reactors cool or their waste fuel cool, etc. So now let's talk about the third myth, wastes, nuclear wastes. So I have another question for you. How much high-level nuclear waste has been produced in the U.S. in the last 60 years? Maybe I should say 63 years. Our first commercial power plant was the year I was born, 1958. Right? So, 63 years ago. Enough to fill up a mountain, a town, a large building, a big room, or none at all? The answer is not none at all. We do have high-level nuclear waste. It's the fission products. 
But amazingly, you don't make that much of them. If you only took out the fission products, the high-level, long-lived nuclear waste, it'd be enough to fill up a big room. Now, the wastes are the things that uranium fell into. It is true that those neutrons go and make the reactor vessel itself radioactive. We call those low-level nuclear wastes. They typically have very low half-life, short half-life, so they would decay quickly. But the stuff that uranium was can be much longer half-lives, <coughs> and it can actually have some forms of not just the things you split the uranium into, but if you added that neutron and then added another neutron before it fissioned, you get things heavier than uranium. And those can have very long lifetimes. Here's the key, though. You don't make much. All right? Got my little, uh, my little table here with the cardboard box. Uh, the amount of waste made in one plant in one year fits under a chair. All right? Now, oh, that's not a chair you want to sit on, <laughs> okay, or be near. But that's the magnitude. And the other thing is that they're in solid form, all right? They're not made out of radioactive green goo that's going to go, um, you know, turn turtles into ninja warriors. And you could store it in a dry mountain, or probably much more cost effectively just in a big, dry, concrete block next to where they were made. And you might say, oh, how can you be sure to store them? How can you make sure nothing gets out? Well, pretty straightforwardly, let's take a canister, and we fill the canister with grout. That's concrete before you add the water. So if someday, somehow, some water leaked in, it would solidify anyway. You make it with stainless steel. You line it with all the right types of materials, OK? Then you uh, dig holes in solid rock, right? And you make sure all those holes are like a thousand feet below uh, the surface and another thousand feet above the water table. And you do this in a stable mountain in a desert. No rain, no erosion, no earthquakes. This is a stable mountain. It's called Yucca Mountain. That was the plan outside of, uh, of uh, uh, Nevada near the nuclear test site, the place where we used to blow up bombs underground with no containment around them, okay? And um, this was the plan. Now, this plan hasn't really happened in part because it's very expensive. You can take those wastes, they're made at a nuclear power plant, they're already there, even if the plant's been operating 60 years or 50 years, all its waste is still there, because not a lot of volume, and you could put it in a big, giant concrete block, okay? Big block outside the power plant, <coughs> right? And inside here, you've got your waste. And you can put monitors all around this and monitors everywhere else, right? And, and you could check on these monitors and make sure that you aren't seeing any uh, radioactivity levels. You can come right up with your handheld Geiger counter and be at background. And this stuff is called dry cask storage, which is probably makes a lot more sense. Sometimes some of these fission products in here in future generations might be considered valuable. You might want to get to them, okay? But in, in some manner, either someday you need to move them or you want right away to move them to this mountain. The question is, how do you get them there? And um, it's really safe to get them there. And you might say, oh, I don't believe that. That truck's going to crash. There's accidents all the time. We're going to irradiate my town. We better pass special rules that say you can't put nuclear materials through my town. But um, I got a video here that was done, and it's kind of fun. And I have a feeling it, it might convince you. And so let's go to the videotape. All right, now this was done actually on real live movie film, and this was from the late 70s. Uh, as you can probably tell from the haircuts, which look an awful lot like my haircut, for the same reason. 
And here is a spent fuel cask. And we move them around on open flatbed trucks. All right? And why open trucks? Well, because you have a chase car going behind them, and if it somehow falls off, you want to know. <coughs> the government already does this, right? Because we have nuclear waste made from when we have uh, nuclear weapons. And we manufactured nuclear weapons for a long time. So they want to make sure that this type of uh, storage isn't going to break. So they did computer models, but no one really trusts computer models. I know I'm an experimentalist. All right, so let's make a real one. And let's put monitors all over it. And then let's put it on a truck and strap some rocket engines on the back of the truck and uh, crash the truck into a giant cement block without a driver. Okay, here it is in slow motion. That's why you don't want a head-on collision with a truck. Now, it withstand so little damage that they said, ah, let's do it another truck, this time going 80 miles an hour, runaway truck. Oh, oh that's, uh, that's a lot more impact. Remember MV squared, right? All right, and that looks pretty bad until you realize that's part of the truck. A couple dents, no loss of integrity. But just wait, what if the, after crashing, it landed on a railroad track, okay? And now we can take a rocket-propelled freight train locomotive and have it crash into it. Okay, um, then a few nicks and scrapes, no leaks, no loss of pressure. Sometimes we move these things by rail. If you move them by rail, well, then uh, the rail car could somehow crash. And you know what? Maybe an airplane had recently crashed, so there it was in a pool of jet fuel. Okay, so let's take our crashed railroad car with the fuel cask in a pool of jet fuel. What brought down the Twin Towers wasn't the impact of the plane, it was the burning from the jet fuel. So we'll have an hour and a half of jet fuel fire. Um, not exactly sure why the fuel wouldn't have just leaked into the ground, but could have been over a swimming pool. All right, and uh, we do this. And even after all of this, <coughs> our storage container did not leak, did not lose pressure, and was still intact right there. So, in the first part of the conclusion, nuclear power is expensive to build, but it's not dangerous to the public. And the common objections, radiation, accidents, wastes, exist predominantly because the population isn't educated on the subject. Right? When we talk about waste, we should talk about waste in compared to other types of wastes. In particular, the CO2 from fossil fuel. You see, I've got one more graph here for you. Energy use by country. Statistics lag a little behind, so I only have 2018. And you notice that the U.S for the past 14, 15 years, even longer than that, we've used about the same amount of energy every year. This is in quads. But the two biggest countries in the world, India and China, even in the last 14 years, their energy use has more than doubled, right? Because they have all these people. And if you wanted to get up to the same standard of livings as in Europe or Asia or other parts of the West, United States, Canada, right, here's the other countries, you are going to have a larger energy level. And you can see that in the last, you know, 15 years or so, we've had a 33% increase in energy. And this is even more impressive if you look at a graph. 600 quads or more in 2019, that's that number way up here. And this is time, right? And those colors you see, right? You got coal, oil, 
natural gas, that's the 85% that's the worldwide. The red band, right, is, uh, is nuclear. And our beloved, and, and they are, I do research on them, solar power, other things, right, they're, they're up there in the, in the small levels. So if we are going to combat and not use fossil fuels for climate or global warming concerns or other health concerns, we're going to need everything we've got here, folks. All right? So my last conclusion is we're going to need nuclear. Thank you very much. And that's what you need to know about dispelling the myths of nuclear power.